electricity. Here we go. Be bold. be bold, be strong, for the Lord your God is with you. Yep. We're going back to the 80s a little bit too. Uh, first slide here. So of the year 1986, the movies Top Gun, Crocodile Dundee, and Platoon were at the top of the box office. The Chicago Bears won Super Bowl number 20. I didn't know it hadn't been going forever, but anyway. Uh, the, the average price of gas was a mere 93 cents. Come on, let's bring that back. Hallelujah. Praise God. Here we go. So uh, the space shuttle Challenger blew up uh, 73 seconds after takeoff. Uh, that whole procedure was uh, so big that even when I was in this uh, young astronauts program in grade school, uh, we did a simulator at the Air and Space Museum up in Seattle to try to not blow it up. And so um, here we go. Uh, you know, the nuclear plant disaster at Chernobyl happened, uh, and the world population was about uh, 4.9 billion people. Uh, we are almost double that now. Uh, and the millennial generation was being born. Hey, hey, here we go. Now, all of these stats I had to look up because I wasn't even born yet. But the most staggering fact about 1986 that I never realized was that this was the year that the world was introduced to the iconic song by Bon Jovi, living on a prayer. Now, that may not be so interesting to you uh, because, you know, songs come and go. Uh, record albums get released every single day. Um, but what I find so interesting about that statistic is that that song, living on a prayer, didn't even make the top 100 singles that year. Uh, now, one of its, uh, uh, you know, sister singles I don't even know if that's a term but you know the other three uh, from Bon Jovi's album uh, that did make the top 100 and that is a popular song but if you were to look at the Spotify tracking on how many plays uh, a song gets played living on a prayer far outshines um, what was it you give love a bad name at 901 million plays Woo! And so as a way of kicking off today's sermon, I would just like to say, whoa, we're halfway there. Whoa, living on a prayer. Take my hand, we'll make it, I swear. Whoa, living on a prayer. Because we've been going through a series looking at Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. It's been a while, friends, and it's going to be a while. But if we were to add up all of the verses... <clears throat> contained in the Sermon on the Mount, at least as we've kind of assigned verse numbers to them because those didn't exist in the original text. But if we were to add up all of those verses and divide it by half, Jesus' teaching on prayer happens exactly in the middle of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. I think that's just divine grace that is kind of happening that way and so in light of bon jovi's classic song and in light on of us talking about prayer i'd like to title today's message living on a prayer <laughs> so our main passage this morning you can go to the next slide is uh, matthew 6 5 through 15 and the big idea that we're going to be exploring together today is that we are shaped by talking with the father we're shaped by talking with the Father. So last week we talked about the way spiritual practices like service, prayer, and fasting can build our faith and develop God's character in our lives. Um, there was that wonderful big idea that I had a, a terrible time saying I'm going to try to read it now just to make sure I get it for sure. But our experience with God is determined by our motives. Um, and that e is evident through our exercise of what's commonly called now spiritual formation, these practices of spiritual things. 
And so just like we experienced today, and just like it was experienced in 1986, and even as it was experienced in Jesus' day when he was teaching his disciples, the world is humming with activity. There is a lot going on. Even though the population has wildly increased from what it was in Jesus' day. I don't have that stat. <laughs> I should have, but I don't. But it's increased greatly. We have so many people in the world today. And yet, even back then, the world was humming, and it's humming even now, where there's a lot of things going on that can distract our attention. It can also, there's so much activity going on that we we need something kind of to anchor us down, to root us in, in things. Like, I love that song, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, that we sang. Um, that holds a very dear place in my heart uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, one, I'm a, I'm a worship leader by trade. Uh, that's what I've done for years and years. And uh, the, whenever you go to a seminar, everybody always brings up, hey, what's an Ebenezer? You all sang it, but you may not know. You may know, and you might be clued into that. Now, there's this, uh, there's this story in the Old Testament where uh, the people of Israel, they were fighting this battle, and they, they erected this monument, uh, this, this rock, and they, they named it Ebenezer, which somehow in the way language works means God has helped us this far that God has been my help this far. And so it was kind of like this promise that God has been my help and God's going to continue to be my help. And so wherever you're at today, uh, I don't suggest using living on a prayer as an anchor point for your faith. It's actually not uh, a very wholesome song. However, <laughs> uh, the idea of a prayer shaping our life and influencing our life as much as the iconic Bon Jovi song, Living on a Prayer, I would submit to you today that we need some kind of a rock to say, God has helped me this far, and he's going to carry me through. You know, like the words of that last song, he's never going to let us down. Amen? Amen. So, I'm off notes already, but here we go. So Jesus, he gave his disciples something. He gave him that prayer, them that prayer, where uh, it's this poem that is meant to kind of serve as this, this stunning declaration about God's kingdom. And so with that in mind, let's turn in our Bibles to Matthew chapter 6, physical or digital. Uh, if you didn't bring a Bible today, that's okay. We have it up here on the screen. But uh, Matthew 6, beginning in verse 5. Jesus speaking to his, his disciples said, And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others, Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them. For your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. For if you forgive others their trespasses, 
your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. The first thing I learned from our passage is that we need to intentionally get alone with God. We need to intentionally get alone with God. Jesus began his teaching with a warning to not be like the hypocrites or the Gentiles, which, as a Gentile, that hurts. But here we go. Uh, don't, be like, don't be like them when you practice prayer, because these two groups and their way of prayer was lacking in two ways. Number one, for the hypocrites, they were doing it all for show so that other people could see them and see how super spiritual they were. Uh, for the Gentiles, number two, is that, you know, they would do this thing where as they prayed, they would try to fit in as many names or titles of their deities as humanly possible to try to cover all their bases in hopes that they would be heard by the gods. And so that's why Jesus described this as a heaping up of empty phrases, because it's not like they really meant it. They were just trying to filibuster the divine. <laughs> they were trying to pull a Mr. Smith goes to Washington before it was cool. And so uh, I digress. But here we go. So they were doing that, and the alternative that Jesus offered was to go to the place where it's just you and God alone, together, in the secret place where you can speak plainly and simply to your Father in heaven. Prayer is not just about doing some religious exercise. It's about a relationship that we experience and develop between us and the Lord. When Jesus set that contrast I don't think he was, uh, he was prohibiting long prayers. Uh, otherwise, some of us would be guilty of that. I don't think that uh, he was outlawing praying in public or else, wow, man, we have a target on us here because we just prayed in public. But, uh, you know, I think what Jesus was actually doing here was that he was laying a foundation for the practice of prayer for his disciples to encourage them for real, honest, genuine prayer, talking with God the Father. Because God knows your need before you even ask him. That means you don't have to twist his arm to try to convince him through your prayer to meet your needs. God is a good, good father, and he wants to give good gifts to his kids. And we'll read more about that in a couple of weeks. Uh, Dan Rather, uh, the, the, the famous news anchor guy from CBS, once asked Mother Teresa in an interview what she said during her prayers. And she answered, I listen. So Dan turned the question and asked, well then, what does God say? And Mother Teresa smiled with confidence and answered, He listens. And for an instant, Dan didn't know what to say. And then Mother Teresa added, And if you don't understand that, I can't explain it to you. Now, in Jesus' teaching, we don't have the word listen anywhere in the text. Even, you know, any translation you go, it's not there. But I think that the heart behind what Jesus was trying to say is, we need to get alone with God. We need to be with God when, where no one else is around and it's just you and the Lord and it's about just being with him, not trying to get something from him. And you know, when it comes to the time of prayer, it is our first priority to seek his face or his hand. Are we more concerned with just getting to be with God or are we more concerned with getting a blessing from him this is not to disregard moments where you know kind of like we were 
singing a little bit ago where the night is holding on to us and we're just crying out to God saying, God, would you just please be here? Would you please rescue me? And we're crying out to him like David did in the Psalms. That's not to disregard that at all. But at the same time, Jesus encourages us in verses 5 through 8 to develop that habit of intentionally getting alone with God because we're shaped by talking with the Father. And it's in that place of prayer that we personally experience God and his goodness. Now, before I go on to the second thing, I need to put this. I have a tea bag here. Nice Tazo tea, Earl Grey. It smells delicious. I'm just going to put that there. All right. Now, the second thing I learned from our passage this morning is that through prayer, we praise God for who he is and what he's done. We praise God for who he is and what he's done. Jesus' model for prayer begins by addressing God as our Father. And even though just a, a few verses earlier, God's described as your Heavenly Father, as people who are in covenant relationship with God, he's not just my Father, and he's not just your Father, he's our Father. There's a communal nature to his fathership of us so god the father he's a divine person that we can relate to through jesus christ god's one and only son who is also one with the father god the son and the truth is that the aim of the kingdom isn't just to build a bunch of grateful army subjects people to be a part of the Lord's army. The kind of family language that's used here means that God's kingdom is actually about building his family in and through us. So addressing God in this way is personal and reverent because the title and role of Father in Heaven describes authority and it honors the place that God holds in our lives. Now, in that passage, Jesus distinguishes God's place of authority in our lives in two ways. Number one, he qualifies it by saying that God is in heaven, our heavenly Father, Father in heaven, which sets the Father apart from his creation. We are not praying to the creation. We're not praying to the created order of the universe. We are praying to the divine personal being who is the father of all creation. And number two, Jesus says that God's name is hallowed. Who uses that word anymore? I don't, but here we go. We read it. And that means it's an old English way of saying the word holy, uh, which is to be set apart, to be unique and distinct in his being and his character. So at a core level, this God that we worship and interact with through the practice of prayer is wholly other than we are. And he is to be seen and known for who he is and what he's like. And that's no different than with our times in prayer. Next in verse 10, we find that right there in the center of this model of prayer is the invitation that through our prayer we're asking God something we're asking him that his kingdom would come and that his will would be done on earth as it is in heaven and so there are three observations I have of this number one really simple our father is in heaven is a king and he has a domain where his rule and reign is secure and his will and way is done perfectly all the time. The Bible calls that place heaven. And the second revelation, or observation even, that I get is that God has a will and a way of how things are supposed to be. The Bible describes God's will as perfect and good. And that this is where his righteous standards and values are the common moral climate and the third observation is that 
earth is a place where God's will and way are not commonly practiced or embraced. Because of our pride, rebellion, and brokenness, are, those are the dominant realities that we face day in and day out. Which is why this request in the model of prayer is for God to come and set all things to right. We're looking forward to the time where he fully establishes his rule and reign here on the earth at the fullness of time at the end. And so this phrase, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, it's messianic. It's apocalyptic. It's Jesus modeling us that we should be expecting God to be doing a new thing because he is doing a new thing and he wants to do a new thing in your life today. And it's in that place of inviting God's kingdom to come to earth that it reveals that we're lacking something and we need his rule and his reign in our life especially in seeking his forgiveness for our moral debts against him. Jesus' model for prayer calls us to live in active anticipation that God will do that new thing. And that the kingdom of heaven and that reality that God wants to bring into our lives is something that's actually God's good for our lives. And so as we pray these words, or ones like them, we are internalizing and engaging with the reality of heaven as we pray. So do you live with this kind of expectation that God could bring about something new and different in your life? Or is it hard to even think about and imagine because you're so used to the old that to even think about there being something new it's, it, it just goes so much against the grain of what you've been experiencing. I think the encouragement that we find is that through prayer, we praise God for who he is and what he's done and what he will do because God is consistent in his character. And that all starts with praise. So third thing we learn from our passage is that Through prayer, we reflect on our lives and we repent of our sin. We reflect on our lives and we repent of our sin. In the secret place, you can go to the next slide, Richard. There we go. In the secret place where we're being real with God and we praise God for who he is and all that he's done, in that quiet time of prayer, we come with all of our stuff, good and bad. Prayer is an invitation for the Holy Spirit to come and help us to reflect on those places where we fall short of his glory and his standard, the places where we need to be made right with God. You can go to the next slide. It's like the psalmist wrote in Psalm 139, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. So when Jesus gave us this model of prayer, he included in verse 12 this portion that says, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And if we're taking an honest look at our lives, compared with the righteousness and holiness of God, it's easy to see the places that we can't measure up to that standard in our own strength. And that there's actually a moral debt that we rack up day in and day out. Even for the people where they might say something like, no, I'm good. Like, I, I'm just, I'm a good person. I'll take my chances. It's fine. Like, when I get to heaven, I'm pretty sure God and me will have a talk and it'll be fine. Even those people on some level at some point experience lack they experience some kind of inequity between this way that things were supposed to be and the way that they are. And so, 
we pray. And the Bible says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God in Romans 3.23. And that the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord from Romans 6.23. You can go to the next slide. What is, I find peculiar and strange about Jesus' model of prayer is that he links our forgiveness with how well we do at living from that place of being forgiven. We give others what we have been given. This is driven home even further in a sort of epilogue to this model of prayer where Jesus issues that conditional statement that I'm sure as we were reading it made some of you feel uncomfortable. <laughs> where he says, if you forgive uh, others' trespasses, your heavenly Father will forgive your trespasses. But if you don't forgive others' trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Now, I'm sure some of us ha have learned some of these uh, prayers or this prayer in, in different formats throughout the years. And there's been this great debate over during the prayer, do we say trespasses? Do we say debts? Do we say sins? What do you say? And when I was looking it up and doing the research, uh, there's actually a difference between what Jesus says in his prayer, the debts that are there, and then the trespasses in this warning. And so the difference is that the first is it's talking about something that's taken or owed to you or, or to the subject. And the other is talking about offenses that are done against you but in either case that core action is the same that we forgive as we've been forgiven and the assumed action is for all of god's people so why is that so important why is it so important for forgiveness to be something that we practice with others even when it's really hard and we'd really much rather not. The reason is that from that place of prayer and communion with God, we are to be shaped by his grace and power. And that ends up in us pouring out and overflowing from that place of grace and power to give that away to other people. That we would be so you know, filled to overflowing with the love of God, that that just spills out of us. But that's hard. Because there's, there's sometimes there's things that people do to us that it, it's really hard for us to get past. Uh, we were just talking, I've been, you know, we've been doing this whole partnership thing with Crossroad Assembly. And that's been amazing. We are also partnering that with the youth group as well. And I've gotten to help out a little bit and sit in on their talks. And uh, the youth just finished up a series on bitterness and how hard it can be to forgive things. And the Bible doesn't call us to, to necessarily have to be reconciled with that person fully to where, oh, we're best buds, we're tight, this is good. But what it does call us to do is that for your own self, that you're releasing that person of that guilt. And God puts his money where th his mouth is because that's what he did for you. And that's what he did for me. And that's really humbling to think about how the God of the universe, someone that we sin against daily even when we don't think about it that he loved you so much that he went to the cross and showed his love for you and and paid that debt so that he could give you that grace as a gift and that's good news and so we've been given to give that now another good news in prayer we learn in romans 2 4 that god's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance and again, in 1 John 1, 9, it says, If we confess our sins, 
God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And these words of Jesus gives us a choice. Will we receive God's forgiveness and then participate in that process by forgiving others in our lives? Or will we refuse to forgive other people when they wronged us? God knows where you're at, and his grace is here for you, and he's patient, and he's willing to walk with you through this in your life. The question is, are you willing to be shaped by it? Will you let that forgiveness transform you from the inside out? Through prayer, we reflect on our lives, and we repent of our sin, and we're shaped by talking with the Father. The fourth thing, (laughs) I'm holding up my hand, fourth thing, Uh, I learned from this passage this morning is that through prayer, we ask God for help. You can go to the next slide. Through prayer, we ask God for help. In verse 11, we see that Jesus gave us the model of bringing our needs to God. Through that famous line uh, that even gets printed on, you know, a cast iron ware and you can buy it at Walmart or something. Uh, Give us this day our daily bread. And that's a reminder that everything we have comes from his hand. Now, that's a reminder of the the literal physical provision of of something like a loaf of bread, which you need to survive. Um, But it can also be recognizing that God has given me breath. He's given me a heartbeat, which uh, given... The events of my earlier (laughs) in this week, I'm really grateful for. Uh, I'm really grateful that my heart is working and that my heart is beating, and that's a good thing, and that God has carried me through. Now, uh, you can go to the next slide, I think, maybe. Yep, here we go. Uh, From James 1.17, we learn that every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights. That's a reference to God the Father with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. So asking God to provide what we need for today reminds us that life is a gift from God, and it brings us to the place of relying on God for his help. Even though uh, we've been also reminded the last couple of months uh, that man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God, uh, Jesus' model of prayer assumes that the Father cares enough about you that he would provide your actual physical nourishment as well for each and every day. And so going to the place of prayer and asking God for help can also include more than just our daily bread. It can be as complex as whatever you're facing in your life right now. Nothing is too small, nothing is too big for you to bring it to God in prayer. This reminds me of the old hymn, uh, What a Friend We Have in Jesus, where the third verse says, Are we weak and heavy laden, cumbered with a load of care? Precious Savior, still our refuge. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Do thy friends despise, forsake thee? Take it to the Lord in prayer. In his arms he'll take and shield thee. Thou wilt find a solace there. I love that hymn. And all the other verses are really good too, but... The truth is God cares about you. And he knows your need and he cares about you. He actually does. Enough to sit and listen as you pour out your heart to him. Uh, Through prayer, we ask God for help with an expectation that he's going to hear us and that that's going to move him to action. Prayer is a trust that God is good. He's faithful, he's true. Uh, When we lay down our pride and we lift up our cares to him in faith, 
It's there that we see that God is our provider and that he's enough. And that he will care for our physical and spiritual needs. <coughs> the fifth thing I learned from our passage. It's a five-point sermon, friends. Here we go. <coughs> is that through prayer we yield our lives to his will and way. You can go to the next one. Next slide. Proceed. There we go. <coughs> Through prayer, we yield our lives to his will and way. So in verse 13, Jesus' model of prayer asks God to lead us not into temptation, but to deliver us from evil. There's four things I observe from this statement. Number one, that prayer includes our yielding to his leading. We are not just assuming the authority in our lives. We are asking God for him to lead us. <clears throat> Number two, that we're asking him to lead us not into temptation. There's a recognition that this side of glory uh, <laughs> and the kingdom being fully established, that temptation is going to happen in your lives. I'm sorry to break the news to you. I'm sure you've experienced this before. But temptation is going to happen. And so it'd be really nice if we didn't come across those things that trigger us and make us fall back into sin. But the third observation is that God, the one who we've yield to, he has the power to deliver us. Amen? Amen. And number four, that all of this points us to the fact that God's kingdom is ultimately the one true kingdom that has the power and the glory forever. Now, <clears throat> here's a point of contention here. That traditional model of the Lord's Prayer, if you were reading a physical copy that wasn't edited by yours truly to put up on the screen, uh, you would find a footnote right at the end of the prayer that doesn't include, not, not yet, back, here we go. Uh, it, it would include a footnote right at the end of lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. And then at the bottom of the page, it would read something like some manuscripts have yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Now there is some contention and dispute over whether or not Jesus actually spoke those words because some of the early manuscripts have, have it in there and some don't. And so there is this, in all the education and higher learning environments, there's a lot of people who say, ah, ha, here we go. That proves you can't trust the Bible. They just throw things in at the last minute. I don't think that's true. I think um, we're not going to settle that debate, by the way. I'm just bringing it up because some people will say, oh, I don't believe that. That's not in there. But what's interesting about this phrase of yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever, amen, is that I think it's in there, and here's why. I think that it's actually a powerful summary of not only the prayer, but also of the Sermon on the Mount, that it is pointing us to the fact that God has the power, that it's all for his glory, and that his kingdom reigns forever and ever. Hallelujah. Amen? And so what's fascinating about that for me is that that's, it's a perfect summary. And so you can have your opinion, I'll have my opinion, and we'll still be friends. It's not really a salvation issue uh, at a core level. However, it's just something, it's interesting to note. Now, earlier in the service, I put this, uh, I meant to do it earlier because it should have been darker by now. All things considered. But I put uh, a tea bag in this, uh, this glass of water. And I'm sure this has been racking you guys with trying to figure out what on earth is he doing. I'm used to the coffee. What's this tea business going on here? All right. So over the time that I've been speaking slowly but surely, <clears throat> moment by moment, the tea has been seeping out into the glass of water and transforming it into 
something wholly other than it was before the tea came into the glass, right? Now, the same, I believe, is true as an illustration for prayer. Uh, you know, we're like the cup of water, unassuming, <laughs> plain tap water, just common, ordinary water. And prayer is like the tea. And from that concentrated moment of prayer, uh, as, you know, if I had just dipped it in and not let it soak there, the, the glass would be relatively unchanged. You might have like a little trail of Earl Grey in there, enough to make you think, oh, I want more. <laughs> right? Um, but what actually formed it into tea was letting it sit there and letting it happen over time and over time. And the, the idea being that we're shaped by talking with the Father. Right? We're transformed as we yield our lives to his will and his way, just like the water ultimately yields to the presence of tea being in the water. It can't help but have tea be there. Now, there's two applications for this, uh, this tea thing in prayer. Okay, The first is that, uh, now you can go to the next slide. So what do we do with this prayer? That is called the Lord's Prayer. Um, when I was growing up, I didn't grow up in a liturgical tradition. Uh, and so one day, uh, I went to a non-denominational Christian church growing up. Uh, and somebody, somewhere along the line, said, Oh, you know the Lord's Prayer. And I thought, I have no idea what you're talking about. You're speaking alien to me. What, what is this thing? Um, so there are traditions within the body of Christ brothers and sisters in Jesus, where they pray this prayer at least twice a day. Uh, it's called the daily office. Um, our Episcopal brothers and sisters, they do that. Um, Lutheran, Catholic, uh, those higher church traditions, they do this on the regular, if you're serious about Jesus. <laughs> uh, but, so there's one way of doing it where you recite it, where you're just literally pouring over the words, or letting the words pour over you, rather, and saying, Our Father in heaven, and the rest of it, where you pray that prayer on the regular so that it does something to you. So that kind of like this tea, the words really start to get internalized for you. The second way is that we can take this as a model, um, which is the more traditional route for us, you know, uh, lower church models, um, is that we take it as kind of a pattern of prayer, that it's not uh, a rote tradition kind of thing that you have to follow, you know, A to B to C equals a thriving life with Jesus. It's more just that these are kind of the pathways of prayer. This is kind of the mode that you do where you go through a time of praising God for who he is and what he's done. You reflect on where you're at in life and you even... Kind of like the psalmist wrote, you invite God and say, God, how am I doing? I mean, I feel like I'm okay, but is there something that I need to confess to you? Because on the surface of things, I feel like I'm okay, but maybe there's something more. So you reflect on where you're at, you repent. And then you go to asking, you bring your petitions to God. You say, God, this is happening. And I need you, I need your help. I need you to do this thing. I, I can't do it, and I, I feel powerless in this situation. I'm lifting it to you. And so through prayer, we ask God for help. Now, what was really fascinating to me earlier this week, I went to the hospital with chest pains. Thankfully, it wasn't actually heart-related. <laughs> Thank God. But um, what was fascinating was, so Angie dropped me off at the hospital, because that's how things are nowadays. And so she dropped me off, her and the kids left. And then suddenly, just like, she got the word out. And suddenly everybody's praying for me and lifting this up. Now, the reason I say model for prayer and how we use this is that when you, if you're praying for me, you don't have to go through each and every one of the steps. Like, you could start with ask. 
it might be a timely thing of we might need this is go time <laughs> jesus here we go and so um but asking is a part of prayer bringing our requests bringing what's concerning our minds to god and then ultimately at the end of it all we yield to him we surrender our will to him i was talking with uh, jim earlier this week and we were uh, i was showing him kind of my process of study and different things and he pointed out just straight away saying hey it's not a lot like when jesus prayed in the garden where he's about to go to the cross he's uh just had the last supper with his disciples uh and him and his posse go to the mount of olives to pray and jesus brings it to god and says lord i know what has to happen but if there's any way can this not happen so that's the ask but then catch this then at the end of it he says but not my will but yours be done and so Jesus isn't just saying to his disciples early on, saying, here you go, guys, good luck. He's actually living this out. And he actually did it. And so for us in prayer, we praise, we reflect, we ask, we yield. And that is inviting God to have his rule and reign in our life. And so whether... <coughs> Whether this example of tea worked for you, I don't know. It, I think it's kind of cool. But kind of circling back around, you know, the bottom line is that as followers of Jesus, we're expected to pray. And uh, in our life, uh, if you were to uh, use one practice or, or thing to have it shape your prayer life and your life, uh, make it the Lord's Prayer. Um, and maybe then we'll be living on a prayer uh there you go had to do it anyway so there we go uh that's all i got for today would you stand and we're just gonna uh close in prayer and i'll i'll send you off with a, a blessing here uh father god we thank you so much for this day we thank you that you are good we thank you that this morning that we got to experience your awesomeness in this place god how great you are we magnify your name we bless your name this morning god we know that your name is holy we set it apart as distinct and honorable god we we magnify that in our lives god we brought up a lot of stuff today we talked about a lot and i'm sure there's a lot stirring inside of us and so god you know our hearts you know where we're at you know what we need to confess and repent to you and so god we lift that to you now god there are there are many things on our minds this week on even on this day and lord i pray that you would bring about your peace in our lives as we as we walk out this life and journey of faith with you and god we yield to you we ask for you to take the lead as cheesy as that country song is jesus take the wheel i mean really we invite you to have control in our life because we know that you're worthy we know that you can be trusted we know that you love us and so, God, we submit ourselves to you. We surrender our will to your will so that your kingdom would come and your will would be done in our lives, in our communities, in our families, in our city, as it is in heaven. So, Jesus, we love you. We thank you. Go with us today in Jesus' name. Amen. thank you friends for joining us this morning it was so good to have you here and so as we go may you go and be like a cup of tea may the grace of our lord jesus christ and the love of god and the fellowship of the holy spirit be with you all amen have a great week